Hi everyone and welcome to our first panel session of the Researcher to Reader conference. This session is going to be about inclusivity within academia and how publishers can be part of a positive change. So we've got 40 minutes, we're going to go fast. The aims of the session today are to really trigger a conversation. The size and the scale of the problem that we're addressing is enormous and we definitely can't do it justice in 40 minutes. So the aim of this session is um, really about sparking that initial conversation, trying to inspire each other and to ultimately encourage players within that publishing industry to be part of a really positive change. So we're not here to argue whether there is a problem. Myself and the panelists are all coming from a position that we agree, scientifically and morally, we should be working towards a more equitable research ecosystem. Our intention is that this will be a product agnostic session, um, but I think it's fair to say that the majority of our experiences as the panel are journals based. Um, but please don't let that stop you asking a question um, that's about maybe conference proceedings or books. The intention is to cover the entire industry if we can. Um, I think it's useful, and if um, we can just move on to the next slide, I think it's useful to start some, uh, just outline some definitions before we get going. There are a few terms around diversity, equity and inclusion that quite often get muddled and interchanged. Um, and while that language is um, complex and constantly evolving, I think it's quite useful to outline what the uh, what the terminologies are that we're going to be using today and what we're interpreting them to mean. The important thing today is that we're discussing and we're debating with good intentions. We, we probably will get some other language wrong at some point, but I want everyone to feel that this is a safe space to have an open and honest discussion. Um, so please feel free to ask a question. Um, and our superstar moderator, Isabella, is going to feed through questions to me. So you should all be able to see um, if you're in the platform, you can see the Q&A panel. Please do send your questions through. If you'd like them directing to a specific panellist, then please do note that in your question and we'll make sure we direct it to that person. So before we get started, just two more things to mention. Um, if we can just flick onto the next slide, there are two other workshops today as part of the Researcher to Reader conference that are linked to today's session. Um, the workshops are running at multiple points throughout the conference. So if you want to attend to both, you will have an opportunity to do that. The first that I wanna draw your attention to is one on inclusive writing. So that's looking at whether traditional publishing gatekeeping standards are actually disadvantaging some important voices. And the second uh, workshop is on a anti-racism framework. So that's looking more at how we can transform our workplace cultures. So do sign on to those uh, workshops if you're interested. So in the interest of time, I'm not gonna introduce all our panel members. Um, if we can flick onto the next slide, you'll be able to see information about them all there. And you've also hopefully seen in the program as well, who everybody is. So the intention for today's session is that each panelist will talk for no more than two minutes, but I'm not gonna blow any whistles at anybody. Um, and they're gonna highlight something that they, their publication, their company is doing to tackle issues related to EDI. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to our first panelist, John. John's gonna set the scene for us a little bit. John, over to you. I think John's still on mute, if we can unmute you, John. I don't know if you've got the power to do that. Unmuted. <laughs> Legend. Okay, start again. Right, so there are reported ethnicity and gender pay gaps in academia. And if we add to that, the double tax of being black and female, make that triple if you're black, female and Muslim, hijabi quadruple that, or if you're disabled or have caring responsibilities, and I think, you know, one of the reasons that academics in these groups are on less favorable contracts also has an impact on how they're able to publish. Because if you're on a casual or fixed term teaching and heavy um, loaded contract at a lower ranking university that pays less and you've got to pay those bills, then it's just really difficult to, to publish, right? So beyond institutional and sector discrimination, and if I wanted to cite the fact that in the UK, out of 20,000 full professors, about 150 are black, including this one. Um, but we have to perform at the same level as if you think about the BAME community, but we have less resources, we have less time, we have less pay. And not to mention um, the mental health and well-being of being in that environment where you know that 
um, you're not given the same support and resources, it's really difficult. Um, because we have to also think about the QDOS and social currency inside of institutions and outside them. Um, and if I was to anecdotally share some stories with you, I mean, I'm a science graduate. Um, I've also graduated from the social sciences and the humanities. I've um, done two doctorates. And one of the things that I observed is that whilst academic research is blind peer reviewed, it's impossible to separate people making evaluative judgments at some stage in the process. And that can be based upon who the scholar is, where the institution is, and these are really subtle and covert ways. So another example, I mean, I know that I don't have much time, but another example is I wanted to do my first PhD in halal and branding, and that was about 10 years or so ago. And I was told that that wasn't a topic. Um, and there were no experts able to evaluate whether that was a topic in theory. So I didn't do it, but I did continue to publish in unranked journals, magazines, do consulting work in uh, overseas countries. And eventually um, people came round to the idea, but I will say that Emerald, uh, the Journal of Islamic Marketing that I edit, um, I've been doing that for about nine years. They were one of the few that, that thought that um, it was a worthwhile thing doing. And so my concern is that there aren't as many people who have the same luxury, passion, luck, stubbornness or rebelliousness as me to kind of stick with it. So if we wanted to think of an actionable solution, I think that publishers could take more of an active role in influencing how institutions operate. Um, they could get involved in monitoring and incentivizing meaningful representation. And that could be in editorial roles, in the content, and within the institutions and also different regions in the UK and abroad. Great, thank you, John. That's a really helpful start. And thank you for sharing your personal experience as well. Um, I totally agree. I think we're, as publishers, we're inextricably linked to institutions. Our products for right or wrong are linked to career progression. So we do absolutely have a role to play in influencing institutions. I'm going to pass over now to Simone. Simone, can you talk about one thing that the BMJ are doing to try and address EDI issues? And I think sure. we've got one of your slides, haven't we? If someone can pop that up for us. Yeah, so um, hi everyone, I'm Simone Ragavulu. I'm the Research Integrity Coordinator for BMJ. Um, so the one initiative I've chosen is one that I thought would be useful for anyone today that's here as a journal editor or maybe a publishing representative that might be in still the early, early stages of their EDI journal journey um, and are looking for some easy steps to do to start to support EDI. So we've recently started doing some outreach with our journal editors to start to gather their thoughts and feelings around EDI. And what we found was that a lot of the editors felt like they could do more, but were expecting sort of the publisher to lead that conversation and reach out provide that guidance on what next steps they should be taking. Um, and from our perspective on the publisher side, we were sort of doing the same thing. We were waiting for our editors to reach out and say, look, I have some more capacity to take this on. I'm interested in supporting EDI through the journal. Could you help to advise us? So sort of armed with that information, um, we took that as the green light to go ahead and see where we could start to develop some practical steps for our editors on what they can do next um, and how we can sort of monitor those steps that they're taking. So we've got this resource, there's a link here, um, which I think will be provided in the meeting hub, but it's also pinned on my Twitter if anyone wants to access it. Um, and it's five quick wins that journal editors can, can do to support EDI and social justice through their journal. Um, and when I say quick wins, these are really like the very quick wins. They're like things that such as just adding an agenda point to your next editorial board meeting or assigning a DNI lead on the journal. Um, so if you're looking for a jump, jumping off point, I think that resource would be really useful. Um, within that as well, we've also added this infographic, which I think is handy for anyone who might still be trying to convince their colleagues, sort of as following on from what John was saying, that publishing and journals do have a role to play in improving diversity and uh, affecting inequality in the wider research community and academia. Um, I think we've all probably heard a view that research is kind of 
publishing is at the end of the research process and by the time it's submitted to us the research is already done so what can we do about the beginning of that um, but this infographic kind of shows that we really should be thinking about the research cycle as as that as a cycle um, and journals are really feeding into this process and the cycle every day particularly when we're not actively trying to challenge that publication bias that is sort of inherent in the fact that it's a human process um, so we can really affect that by challenging our and using our editorial processes to impact this. Um, so really what we should be trying to impact is this sort of disproportionate rejection rate that we've seen for minority groups. Um, and as Kim said as well, we know those publications go a really long way to supporting an individual and in becoming a more established researcher and then affecting that representation. And it's a big cycle. Um, so obviously, as probably a really big theme of today is publishers are not the only cog in that wheel, institutions are not the only cog in that wheel, everyone has to do their own part. So I think this, I hope this kicks off today with the sort of sentiment that we can all act within our own sphere and together that will like compound the effect um, and we'll start to see some change, even if it's a really long way down the road. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Simone. That's a really useful resource. And I totally agree with what you say about everyone's, it, we, we can't do this on our own. We are all one cog in a very big wheel. Um, but just moving one cog is, is a really useful start because hopefully the other cogs will move and exactly. follow on. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Nicola now, who's from the Royal Society of Chemistry. Nicola, can you talk to us about one thing the RSC are doing in this space? Sure, thanks, Kim. Um, so I want to talk really briefly about um, this cross uh, publisher initiative that the Royal Society of Chemistry initiated and, and has been leading. Um, so hopefully you can see the slides on that, um, which is our joint commitment for action on inclusion and diversity in publishing. And there's a link on the slide, but also I, I believe Isabella is going to um, pop a link in the chat, uh, the Q&A box on the platform as well. Um, but this initiative has been built really on, on a number of years of, of work of the inclusion and diversity team, the fantastic inclusion and diversity team at um, Royal Society of Chemistry, the work they've been doing around inclusion and diversity in the chemical sciences community. And obviously, I don't have time to cover all of that today. Um, but in the early part of 2020, um, RSC launched our Framework for Action in Scientific Publishing. Um, and again, I think Isabella is hopefully able to post a link to that in the Q&A um, section. But this framework document maps out uh, the steps we're taking to try to minimise bias across our portfolio of journals. And we are continuing to work with our editorial boards and editorial staff to implement the actions detailed in that framework document. But um, in uh, June of last year, <clears throat> excuse me, we also shared the, the our framework with other publishers and, and of course it's now publicly available um, because we wanted to really help accelerate a, a culture change in scholarly publishing. So we convened a cross publisher workshop where we presented our framework and then we had a, a really productive discussion with the publishers there about the areas that publishers could work together on to accelerate progress. And the joint commitment that you can find at this link um, is really the output of all of that discussion. And it sets out the four top level areas where publishers who signed up have, have agreed to, to work together, share learning, collaborate, and, and really try to accelerate change and also to amplify our voices and, and the impact that we can have. We started out, I think it was with around 13 publishers in June of last year. and The initiative has really grown and grown ever since. So if I could move on to the next slide, please. Um, as I said, the signatories to the joint commitment are signed up to these, these sort of four top level ideas, really. So the first one being about understanding our, our research community. And this is really all about um, collecting the data. So allowing diversity data to be self-reported by the members of, of, of our research communities. Secondly, we've committed to reflecting the diversity of our community. So this is about once we've got that data, using that and sort of aggregate and anonymized data to um, potentially uncover subject specific diversity baselines and then use those to go on to set targets to achieve appropriate and inclusive representation, for example, in editorial decision makers. Thirdly, we talk about sharing success to achieve impact. And this is really just about um, sharing and, and even developing new resources, transparently sharing our policy and policy development um, processes, and um, really knowledge sharing, I suppose, to, to move inclusion and diversity in publishing forward um, together. 
lastly we talk about setting minimum standards so um, essentially we've committed to really scrutinizing our own publishing processes and taking action to achieve a minimum standard for inclusion in in publishing and work is ongoing to draft those minimum standards um, which um, will um, have taken influence from the, the Royal Society of Chemistry's framework for action that I mentioned previously. And I think what's important to say is that by signing up to this joint commitment, it's it's not just a statement, it's not just words, we're, we're collectively taking action. So we have formed a working group with representatives from each signatory organisation. The group meets um, three times per year, and in fact our next meeting is later this week. And We've also formed sort of subgroups, so structure within that who are taking forward specific areas of action under each of the commitments. So just by way of, of an example, the, the subgroup group looking at diversity data collection systems under the first commitment, um, that group um, has, for example, reached out to third parties such as peer review system vendors and the likes of ORCID to really start that conversation about what are the right systems with which to collect diversity data. And another example, the policy development group under the third commitment that I'm involved with, um, we've been discussing policies around author name changes after publication, and we've been working to develop some good practices that we can share with the group. Um, and we've also reached out to the likes of COPE and STM, who we know are also working to standardise um, things in this area. So I'm just going to finish if on the next slide, please, um, to leave you with um, the, the, all of the signatory organisations. I should clarify that another three have actually joined since I made the slide. Um, so you can see all of the logos if you follow the link. Um, but we're, yeah, we're currently up to 35 publishers all working together to um, hopefully accelerate change. Amazing. Thanks so much, Nicola. I just take my hat off to all of you at RSC leading that joint initiative. Um, uh, we remember and um, it's been absolutely fantastic like you say it's not just about making a statement and that echoes our sentiment with the session today this is about active change and making a difference um, and I think the fact that we're we're all joining this joint initiative with such um, force and speed shows just what appetite there is to see that change Indeed, thank you yeah. Nicola that's brilliant thank you um, so finally uh, Nicola sorry Catherine Apologies. Um, so Catherine, can you talk to us about an action that the Company of Biologists have taken in the EDI space? Yeah, sure. So um, I've, I've got a slide up as well. I'm kind of going to talk around the slide rather than uh, through it, but we can get that up, I think. So I've become personally increasingly involved in sort of diversity and inclusion initiatives through the realisation that in many of the activities in which I'm involved from sort of commissioning articles, recruiting referees for the journal, through to organising conferences, it's sort of all too easy to extend invitations to the people you know, rather than seeking out new voices and giving opportunities to those who aren't already on the radar. And the sad reality is that those people who we already know are by and large white men from privileged institutions. Um, and I think, you know, we've all become much more aware of these problems over recent years. There's been a lot of discussion and analysis over the degree to which individuals from underrepresented minorities suffer. And at development, what we really wanted to do as a journal was to do something practical to try and support our community in trying to improve diversity and inclusion. And we felt like we were in a really good position to, to do something. We're very much a community journal and we run a very successful community blog called The Node, which has very high visibility within the field. And we'd become aware of similar efforts in related fields to uh, provide uh, databases of um, underrepresented scientists or um, you know, women scientists to for people to, to, to search through. And so we've set up a, an inclusive database of developmental and stem cell biologists called the Node Network. And this details information on individuals' affiliation and scientific expertise, but it also allows people to volunteer that information on various aspects of diversity, sort of including but not limited to gender, ethnicity, LGBTQ status, disability, and so on. And users can search the database based on scientific expertise, but also based on, on these characteristics. Um, and we're getting up to close to a thousand members and we really hope that this and other resources like it provide a venue for the community to identify individuals that they might not otherwise have thought of for their conferences, for writing articles, for panel members and so on, and to achieve therefore greater diversity um, in those conferences, panels, journals and so on. And on a personal level, I've definitely used it to sort of reach out beyond the usual suspects and to try and give a platform to a more diverse and, and therefore I think more interesting uh, set of voices. 
And I think I just end by sort of echoing what the other panelists have already said that as publishers, you know, we really have a responsibility uh, to ensure that we appropriately reflect the diversity of our communities. But actually more than that, we have an important role to play in helping those communities to become more inclusive as we move forwards. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Catherine. That's really helpful. Um, thank you, everyone, so much for giving us your very quick overview. I appreciate that was a big ask to, to ask you to summarise a, a key piece of work in two minutes. So thank you. Um, we are hoping now to hand the rest of the question over to uh, sorry, the rest of the session over to questions from the audience. Um, so Isabella is feeding those to me. Please do um, put them in the Q&A box. Um, so I'm going to start with one uh, question that's come in from the audience. Nicola, if that's OK, I'm going to direct it at you. Um, and that's, do you think publishing organisations should be setting specific targets or quotas? Thanks, Kim. Yeah, so, I mean, I think this is something we've we've thought about, and it, it, I guess it depends depends um, in which area you mean. But but one thing um, we've started to, to do at Royal Society of Chemistry is look at the, the gender diversity of our um, publishing community. Um, and, and and we started with gender because that's something we were able to um, assign assign gender based on on a sort of um, using name and country and so on rather than we, because we didn't actually have the data. But w once we sort of understood the baseline of the gender diversity of, of our, our research and, and publishing community, we then compared that to um, the the gender diversity of our our editors and our reviewers, and there were there were gaps, there were differences, and so we chose to um, set ourselves some, some targets to to um, bridge those gaps and to to so that our the diversity of our editors and reviewers should match that of that of our authors. Um, so I think that the targets can be useful; that they can be. Um, um, they can sort of spur action. I guess the the, port, the important point there is that in order to do that, you need the data. And um, so data collection, diversity data collection really underpins a lot of the action that we're able to take in terms of setting targets. Um, and there's, yeah, a, a, it's not an easy task to um, to understand the diversity of, of our publishing community. That's um, something we still are, are working on, I guess. Great, thanks, Nicola. Um, another question, um, Simone, if it's all right, I'm going to direct this to you. Um, how can we improve the situation? I know there's been some uh, blogs and articles published on this recently about the fact that the move towards gold open access, so article publication charges particularly, can be seen as a barrier to inclusion. Um, sure, yeah, so open access, obviously, I feel like the intention there is to support equality and making work available for everyone is, is really good. Um, but I do agree that publication in these highly ranked journals is becoming very costly and there are reasons for that, but it is getting to a point where people are starting to note that it could threaten the academic freedom to publish. Um, and I don't know if anyone saw that Emerald publishing study on barriers to inclusivity, but um, one of the things that I think was quite surprising is that poverty was actually mentioned as the one of the highest barriers to inclusion um, at about 60% just after ethnicity and um, racial discrimination um, and that really was location based so in the UK and in the um, global north that was seen as less of a problem and I think there's obviously a big disconnect there and if we don't start to address that um, we might start to see this rise in publishers opting for fair trade alternatives these APC free alternatives and I've seen a lot of discussions on that in the social sciences a lot and um, specifically um, when we spoke about this topic at BMJ as well some of our editors mentioned that it can seem quite hypocritical for us to be having these discussions on social justice when we have a lot of things behind this APC barrier um, so I think really the first point and we, maybe possibly the only one is looking at your waivers policies um, and really asking the questions about what criteria are you using um, is actually supporting authors from low income countries. Do they even know it's there? A lot of publishers kind of don't promote the fact that those waivers are there because it's sort of, oh, more people will request it and that's more money costing for us. But really, is that the purpose of a waivers policy in the first place? Like, is, it, is that view supporting diverse authorship and preventing that barrier? And I think maybe it's about moving away from thinking of waivers as sort of a charity and more towards, you know, we should want research from all over the world and we should start to 
to really be supporting that. Um, so really, I would say, yeah, waivers, policies and um, and things like that would probably be the best point of call. Great, thanks, Simone. One question I'm going to direct to John now. So this has come from Alice. Um, Alice says, as an editorial services provider, we receive, an RF, we receive RFPs from major publishers. We're still finding that some publishers are requiring bachelor's degrees from team members, even though we don't actually provide any scientific or content work. We think this might put, be putting up unnecessary barriers. How do the panel feel about this requirement? Interesting question. Um... I think at some stage you have to decide, you know, what qualifications are required. Um, and also I can understand that tactically, if you are a publisher, having your staff, um, having obtained degrees would be important and it would, it would signal, yeah, um, I guess, rigor, um, you know, certain level of proficiency, whether you are actually involved in research or not, I don't think necessarily matters, but having a, um, a higher level of understanding. Uh, having said that, though, a degree is, in some respects, a proxy for those skills. And so I think there's nothing wrong with having another um, avenue open uh, so that you can welcome applications from other individuals who can demonstrate um, those skills. And so I think it's quite an important mapping exercise that could be taken, which is, okay, well, what are the core skills that we need? And we understand that currently, you know, those are judged to be from, from university graduates. But if you can demonstrate those things, then we're okay with that. But we do know that it's a little bit more complicated. I mean, as an, as an educator, I would argue that it's not just the subject, but it's the level of, uh, I guess, intellectual assessments that we've put students through that, that would then mean that they have skills that they've acquired which which would last them for for a long period of time but that's not to say that you can only get it um through going to university but the final point that i'd make is that um when we talk about inclusivity and if i focus on the areas that i know better which are to do with um uh, gaps between uh, gender and and black and asian minority ethnics you will see that there are many more black and asian minority ethnics and women at university relative to the population sizes. So, so those communities are maxing out on qualifications. Um, so if we, uh, so I'm not quite sure, obviously, because I don't know the context, but if people talk about the degree being the barrier, often you find that women are far more qualified than men. And, and some members of the BAME community are far more qualified. Um, that's not the barrier. The barrier is not being given a chance not being selected, going to interview, um, or on some in, in some cases, it's not being given the support. So you don't go for the job and you deselect yourself, or you're not ambitious in going for promotions because you think you might fail, and that being misread as lack of career ambition. So I think there are a lot of other factors. When we talk about inclusivity, it'd be easy to say that it's the degree, but probably there are a number of other reasons. Uh, not to mention the fact that, that you know, I mean, coming from an advertising background, if your copy doesn't look representative, if the language isn't representative, if when people ask around, you're not currently representative, there, there are probably lots of uh, gaps in, in a number of places. And I would say the degree is probably the last place you should look because there are some really qualified minorities out there. Right, thank you, John. I agree, it's, I think that's a question, um, or rather a requirement that's potentially masking some of the issues. Um, and there are different ways to deal with the fact that it's certain skills that you're after, that you know, having a degree in chemistry doesn't necessarily help you on a biological physics journal. Um, so yeah, I agree. I think there's, um, there's definitely some nuances and some changes that we could make within the industry about those requirements. I'm going to put a question to Catherine now. Um, uh, Nicola has asked about the Node Network. She says it sounds like a really important resource. Do you know if any equivalent exists in the humanities and social sciences community? And I don't know, John, you may also be able to weigh in on that, given your experience in that sector. We'll start with Catherine. Yeah, so I mean, I don't, but then to be honest, I haven't looked terribly hard. I think we really focused on looking at, at similar initiatives in the sciences, of which there are sort of increasingly... Uh, more of these, um, some focused specifically um, on lists of, of women, but more and more also things that are, are looking at other aspects of diversity. 
Um, I think the one thing I would say is that if there are people out there who are interested in setting something similar up to the Node Network, I'm more than happy to talk about it. There are quite a lot of issues um, around GDPR in terms of setting up something like this and making sure that we're doing it in an appropriate way. Um, and I'm, like I say, I'm more than happy to talk to anybody who's who's interested in, in setting up something. And again, if anybody else knows of, of any um, any initiatives for the social sciences or humanities, then you know, stick it into the Q and A because I think they're they're really potentially very useful resources. I wonder if there's an opportunity actually for a, a collection of those resources to go in the same place. Just I, I don't know if um, yeah, I'm spitballing now, but I, I, it does. It strikes me that if there are multiple ideas like that around, that could actually be a really useful resource, not only for people within the academic. Kind of ecosystem but from a you know journalists looking for people to comment on that kind of thing could be really absolutely useful. and you know some of these initiatives are directed towards more towards sort of journalists and public outputs and things so things like 500 women scientists and there's a comment what it's called now um something to do with an expert um yeah sorry i can't remember the name but i will look it up and try and find it but there are some things that are also directed sort of more outward facing um, towards journalists and, and sort of um, outreach and things like that. So those things do exist and I agree it would be useful to have a, a centralised resource for, for collecting these things together. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, Simone, I'm going to direct another question we've had um, over to you and this is about historical content. What should or could journals do about historical content that might be offensive by today's standards? Um, I was expecting this question, actually, because I think a lot of people are worried about this, especially publishers, and people have been talking about it from a long, for a long time. And I think the reason there hasn't really been a consensus on what everyone should do is because uh, publishers are quite scared of getting things wrong. Um, we actually discussed the matter with our ethics committee, and, and they weren't in favour of uh, removing that content, in, is, as it could be seen as sort of whitewashing history. And it's more important to really acknowledge that that did happen and discuss sort of the impact of those publications and, and what effect that had on the community and, and research and things like that. Um, there, we have discussed also whether it would be better to have a disclaimer um, just to make it really clear that our publishing views do not, um, aren't, don't agree with that to, by today's standards or by um, what we would publish now. I do think it's more important really to look at your processes going forward and what you have in place now to make sure that you wouldn't be publishing um, discriminatory science or, or stuff of that nature now. Um, I think also it's really important when you're looking at these kind of policies um, or things that you action you might want to take to not um, be so internally focused when you're having those discussions. I think we have a tendency to talk about these internally or even cross publisher, but it's still a very similar community. As we said before, we all have quite similar backgrounds. Most of us have science degrees. Um, so we could be in danger of sort of having only that westernized view or that quite internal focus. So one thing that we find with those sorts of topics at BMJ that's been really helpful is sort of doing roundtable discussions, seeking people from outside of your community, the people that are really impacted and affected by those publications, what do they think? Um, using head-to-head -head debate formats on a publicly facing um, like editorial content, because um, then you have an opportunity for the public to feed in their thoughts. You can take that on board when you're making your policies and um, you get both sides of the debate, sort of similar to how we would do patient and public partnership with research anyway. Um, and I think lastly, it's really important to be open and honest about where you are in the process. So editorialize your process, talk about it. Say you're looking for feedback and say you plan to review um, the impact of whatever policy or action you took um, and, and be clear about what maybe what mistakes you made, you know. Great, thank you, Simone. Um, we are getting towards the end of the session, so I'm gonna try and squeeze two more questions in if we can. Um, so brief answers if possible. Um, I know we could talk about this all day. Um, so we've had a question from Frank Norman. John, I'm gonna direct this to you. Will the dominance of the US and European publishers continue, do you think, as China's influence grows? And if not, what does that mean for EDI? Um, in my field, I think, uh, Western dominance will continue because um, most of the most cited um, literature is in English. Um, so that's always going to be in, in the West's favor. However, that's not to say that you can't have publishers coming out of China who are publishing in English language. Um, I think it'd be quite interesting to just explore uh, what that means because you're gonna have different editorial teams, you're gonna have different uh, ways of thinking. It could be quite interesting actually. 
Um, Because I know, for example, if we look at, you know, places like Malaysia and Singapore, um, they have been really innovative, particularly in my field and in English. Um, So I would look forward to that. But But I do get that when you go, if you look at diversity and inclusion, that also means there are different interpretations. Not everybody agrees with what constitutes racism or whatever. Um, so I think that we would need to have that kind of roundtable discussion, but it might be quite an interesting approach. Just one final point before I hand, get, hand up my mic. Simone, right, you got me thinking, and we don't have time in the session to answer this question, but I, I get the idea of not wiping out historical uh, racist research, for want of a better term, right? But the, the thing that I want everyone to think about is then, what about current racist research? Because basically, historical racist research exists, and we can we can pull it to pieces. But then, what about today's racists who feel that they don't have a platform with which they can share their ideas? And I just want us to think about how we manage that process without cancelling them. Like, can we invite them into that that kind of nice uh, boxing ring and, and just beat the crap out of them? I mean, that's what I was thinking about. Okay. I'll stop now. I just love how blunt John is. That's fantastic. <laughs> I agree. I think that's a really interesting topic, probably for discussion another day. I don't think we're going to have time to squeeze in that last question. So apologies to anybody whose questions didn't get answered. It was always going to be a tough job to try and get through everything. Um, but a huge, huge thanks to our panellists and especially to those of you that have also asked questions or engaged with us via Twitter. Really, really appreciate it. Like we said at the beginning, this is the start of a conversation. We're not here to provide answers or tell anybody how something should be done. This is about facing into a challenge together and trying to find a way to make positive change and learning from each other. So I'm gonna wrap the session up now. There's a few bits of housekeeping. So if you can hang on for just a moment. Um, I believe there's a participant survey that you can do that gives a rating and a comment for this session. Please be kind. Um, There's gonna be a 30 minute break now. So um, do feel free to take a break, but you can also come and chat to people live in the virtual networking rooms. If you haven't played with it, I had a little play with it earlier this morning and it's really quite fun. You get to move towards people and go and talk to them and then you can move off to someone else in the room and go and talk to them. Um, And you can always talk to the sponsors in the exhibit area as well. In 10 minutes, I think it's 11.20, there's a lightning poster session, the first of which is Sally Wilson from Emerald. um, And that's about driving cultural change for societal impact. So again, it's linked to some of the themes we've been talked to today. Um, I've been asked by Mark, the organiser, to say that if this is your first time visiting the the virtual room, sorry, please make sure you put in your name and also some information about you when you're prompted. Any technical problems, just use the help function in the main event problem, uh, sorry, main event platform. You can tell I'm reading fast. Um, And uh, myself and I think the other panel members, we're gonna try and hang out in the networking space now um, to continue the conversation. And again, um, hopefully you've all got our emails and our Twitter links and all that stuff you should be able to find in the meeting hub somewhere. Um, I'm happy to be a conduit if you can't find someone's contact details and put you all in touch. So if you want to go back to your timeline now, click on the networking agenda item to come and network with us um, or just go and make yourself a brew. Thank you ever so much again to our panellists and to the people asking questions and just the people who were listening and learning. Really appreciate everyone's engagement. I'll see you all soon. Thanks, everyone.